No. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Farzana Sand, turn a mic on. A very warm welcome to all of you to our session. Two things. Uh, sorry, I have to stand up. It's getting a little. It's getting a little formal and a little sticky out there. So just turn to the person on your left and your right. Shake your head like this and say myself and tell them your name and give them a smile. Come on. Let's do it. Let's get into formal. Please. Myself, whatever. So if I'm sitting like this, I'll turn around and say, hello, myself, Rocky. Hello. Excuse me. Hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, myself, Mayur. Come on, please. Introduce yourselves. Make some friends. I can't see you doing it. I won't stop till you do. Oh, there we go. I, I like the shake of that head. Young lady, could you stand up, please? Yes. P please stand up and show them how it's done. The head shakes like that and you say, myself, whatever. Excellent. Excellent. You know, this is a classic case of hijacking. <laughs> it's called culinary hijacking. All right. Um, a very good afternoon, everybody. I am Frizana Contractor. Um, like my co-panelists very nicely introduced me already. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in uh, Madras. It's a wonderful city. I don't know why I don't come here more often. I think the whole organization of this thing was fantastic. The coordination and everything else was simply good. We've all been to a whole lot of these and I think we all were doing this backroom talk and we realized that it is wonderfully well organized. Thank you so much for having us here. And we can see that you, you are a little more interactive than the Bombay audiences we're used to. So that's great. <laughs> Um, very quickly, there's another reason why I'm definitely thinking of moving to Chennai. Uh, Mr. Muttu, the really nice man who's been driving us around for the last two days today, I asked him, I said, have you had lunch? He said, no fasting today, not much. So I said, did you eat something? He said, yeah, I had vegetable, vegetarian biryani. So I said, when you have a fasting day, you eat vegetarian food? He said, yes. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm now going to invest in property in Chennai and move right here. All right. Okay, so let me go ahead with the introductions. I have Pascal Dupuy next to me, the GM of the newly opened hotel, uh, the Leela in Madras. He's got 24 years of experience under his belt. He comes from France, which was his first uh, career starting point, a wonderful hotel called Negresco, which is Michael Jackson's favorite. Did you know that? And um, he went on to Mauritius. He grabbed the opportunity to take this Mauritius job because he wanted to step into Asia. From there, he came on to Goa at the Leela. And now that he's in India and in Madras, I can tell you he's not going away any other country. Right, Pascal? Definitely. Chef Dharmen Makwana. Sorry, can, can I just say, if when you introduce me, just talk about the experience I've got under the belt, because I just love the sound of that. Shut it's, up. Uh, ignore, like ignore, sounding. ignore, <laughs> ignore. And you know the ohm that he did in the beginning was just his belly speaking. He just had a huge lunch and he came. That was not hey, He's given you a big opening. He said, talk about what under his belt. It's a big belt. I mean, he's, he's help, trying to help you out here, really. <laughs> Terrible. I'm, I'm not sure how this is going to go. I'm not sure at all. But coming to Dharmen, um, Dharmen looks Indian, is not very Indian. He was born in Surat, grew up in Singapore and uh, went on to Australia. He's been outside everywhere in Egypt, some of the most exotic hotels, um, the Sharm el Sheikh, and I don't know where else he's been, uh, with the Nico, which is where he um, really fine-tuned his Japanese food and the love for it. And uh, he was lured to India at Amar Vilas, which is the Oberoi Hotel, and now he's in your city. Make the most of him. These two characters, I have to say in the same breath. Madam, I was just looking for the bathroom passing keep by. Quiet, keep quiet, keep quiet. <laughs> for two minutes, keep quiet. I'll give you a turn to speak. Uh, they're like peas in a pod. You have to introduce them together. Obviously, they're famous or rather notorious for that hugely popular TV show that they do, Highway on My Plate. I keep saying platter, I don't know why. Uh, more distinguished, maybe. We, we take that if a platter is larger than a plate. <laughs> okay, so they two are these great guys who between them have honestly changed the way people look at food on, uh, you know, the trees along the streets and roads of India. A phenomenal job. They've written a book by the same name, uh, gone on to win awards which doesn't mean anything because their award and their reward is in this TV show that they do. But um, much more than this, they've been friends since 1976, which makes it 36 years. Uh, they've stuck each other because they're like alike, as you can see. And um, uh, Mayur, 
uh, went backpacking and stayed away for a decade, lived, worked, did all kinds of things overseas, only to come back deciding the best food is in India. And he came back. And uh, he writes, he writes a lot. He writes for the New York Times and FHM, and I don't know which other publications, we'll know that by and by. Rocky, this character, who's quite a handful, and I wish they had those seat belts over here, like in the plane, to strap him down. But um, Rocky has done it all. He has worked in Dubai um, as a GM, some kind of a corporate training firm. He's worked in Miami as, in a multinational. He has uh, run a restaurant. He has had a gas distribution ship company, whatever, right? Um, Wait, wait, you've done something else. Yes, and then he's got this Mind's Eye, which is still running. It's a firm which you probably uh, started in 2004. I don't know when, but he gave up his jobs in 2004 at the ripe age of, what, 30? Well, a little more, maybe, <laughs> yes. And then he... A couple he, of years here or there. And then from 2007, these guys have been on a roll. Introductions out of the way. Can I carry on? Yes, please. All right. I'm While I don't have brief, a seatbelt, can I, I go respect, a little dance? I respect the Hindu very much. And uh, it's among my favorite papers. And since they've told me uh, what I should really be doing, I'm going to kickstart on that. So let's be quiet for five minutes and just discuss what is good food writing. I don't know but um, the trend today, but good food writing for me is all about simple writing writing as descriptively as possible. Uh, it's not about yourself or your own ego, who you are and what you are and what you've seen and where you've come from, but it's about the dish in front of you, the man who has cooked it, and the people who are gonna go and eat, which I think a lot of people have actually today forgotten. Um, when I started Upper Crust, which is the Food and Wine magazine, 14 years ago, uh, there wasn't anything in that genre there was no food and wine, dedicated food and wine magazine. It was tough to get writers, but we had one writer who was our crowning glory, and I don't know how many of you might have heard of him, but he was a journalist called Baram Contractor, and he wrote about food because he really, really loved food, and uh, he wrote about food under the pen name of Busy Bee. Those days, when he really started writing, since he's considered this father of um, food writing in India, um, it was in the early 60s, even late 50s, when he started writing about hole-in-the-wall places, uh, Muhammad Ali Road in Bombay, and he made slumming very, very fashionable, what these guys are doing now. I mean, you know, at that time, uh, people only went to restaurants in five-star hotels. So if I can have that, um, some shots, I'm going to show you how he teamed up. Um, those days, they never bothered about too much about cameras and pho photographs and things like that. So it was, they relied on drawings. This is the very famous cartoonist called Mario Miranda, who unfortunately passed away last year. He and Behram Busy Bee were a team, and they would go to all these kind of places. That's the very first one happens to be a dhaba. And uh, just to illustrate, okay. That's when he started to eat things like octopus. We're talking 40 years ago. And that was Mario's way of doing it, and that's, I just want to pay a tribute to Mario. That's his image over there. So he would draw all kinds of such things, and they would illustrate the writing. Life was very, very simple in those days, and that's Behram. Can we have that off? Um, I'm coming to you, Mayur. You write a lot. Yeah, can I just interrupt? I, please, gentlemen, just remember that face, because what the lady said was, before he came along, everybody used to eat only in five-star hotels. And now, after he's done that, people eat many other places. So that's the guy that's working and putting out a business, so. No. You're right. Formerly, there was only five-star eating in Bombay particularly and slumming it out. There were no in-betweens, there were no, um, you know, standalone restaurants like there are now. In fact, the more threat to you is now from them. But, Mayur, Good recall. tell me about food writing. What's your opinion? Um, there's uh, two things I want to share. I actually read a very interesting article on, on, on the flight here and the two learnings I got from it. One was that humans um, we're unique in that we're the only species on this planet that cooks their food and we're the only ones that have the gift of telling stories. Um, the second one is a bit of a stretch, maybe the ooh ooh that monkeys do, I mean maybe they're telling a story, I don't know. So it's A, we're very fortunate we're able to do that. And then there was a very famous guy called A.J. Liebling who said the first requisite of good writing about food is a good appetite. Okay. 
So, uh, I mean, if, if, if Rocky carries on at this rate, we're going to win one of those Booker Prizes also. So. Completely. Okay. I'm, I'm not stopping. I'm good with that. Okay, Darben, um, do you despair when you read uh, about the writings of some of the people of the food you might have cooked? Because um, not so much the content, um, it's not about a good review or a bad review, but about the style of writing. Uh, what do you think is happening in the country? You, you have been in Amar Vilas for a few years. I think it's very descriptive. Uh, people tend to write about their experience, taste, textures. They're getting more detail oriented in terms of uh, reporting the kind of food that they eat. So it's very detail oriented. That's my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was doing this green room chat with everybody and I believe that there are a lot of good writers in Madras and I was very, very happy to hear that. In fact, he was telling me, so that's wonderful. I think it is reflective of the kind of cities we all come from. Bombay is getting so erratically fast that anybody with a smartphone, uh, anybody who thinks they can, uh, they like to eat, go to restaurants, shoot a picture, it's on the Facebook, it's on their blogs. So uh, th while there are some good writers coming along, the bloggers are quite a threat because it's very, it's very irresponsible writing. With that, I shall close. And if I can have the images again, I want Rocky and Mayur to have a good look at these images. And tell me. Okay, this question I'll ask you later. All this is good food, okay? Sorry? <laughs> That's why they kept this post-lunch. The Garupa doesn't want to go away. That's it. Okay, what do you think? This is all good food to you? Uh, no. Okay. It's very it? pretty. <laughs> I'd like to buy a dinner. Or, or does it, uh, good food have to be teppanyaki and such stuff? Or cut cuisine like they shove things into oh, there the earth? That, that's looking interesting. That's right, I thought so. Okay. Uh, if I could take a minute, I just, I just want to... I just want to answer your question of what, what is good food. No, 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 not now, not now, not now, not now. Can I? No, 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 you can't interrupt. Hold on, let's finish with this. Okay, soups, comfort food, truffle oil and God knows whatever else. He's very impatient. Rocky, hold your horses. Right now they're eating them in London. This is one of those chairs, if you sit forward, you're uncomfortable. If you sit back, you feel strange. Dal bhati. Khichri. Sorry. Is that comfort food? Much better. We're getting there. We're, oh, that's looking better already. All right. This is khichri, which we love to eat in Bombay, and I think everywhere else we have a rice and a lentil dish. Or is it about fresh foods? No, I'm not big on Vegetables. these kind of things. <laughs> I think it's great, and they use so much of it in South Indian restaurants, cuisine. Truffles? That, that is good food. It's good? If you barbecue that guy sitting in the back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> He's so horrible. You, you know With she has a magazine. And olive oil. I mean, we've got the whole recipe right there. You know she has a magazine about Did dogs. Did you know right? what that was? Yeah, right. Did you know what this is? Hot dog is all that's on my mind right now. They are now. trotters. That's okay. that's the quality. I'm trying to show you quality. All right, Paya. That's your lovely Leela in Bombay. Souffles and things. It doesn't go away. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Okay, off. What is your definition of good food? Sure. Uh, you guys are on the road. Um, how many? Uh, 250 days of the year, uh, 100,000 kilometers, 1,000 restaurants, 600 recipes they have devoured. 6,000. 6,000. 6,000 recipes. They've done it all, seen it all. The whole trend is changing now with lots more television, lots more everything else. You're leading the pack. I would like you to take our audience through your experience and tell us just what is good food according to you guys. Okay, please, whoever's controlling this, just shut off their mics. I'll just take 20 minutes or so. We'll have a little chat. So uh, here's what I think is good food, and here's why I think it. Now, let me, let me say we, we do this show, and some of you may have seen it, and we do a lot of work with food on several levels, and I want to go back to the human brain and its origin. At the core of the human brain is what we, what we call the reptilian brain. In the Triassic era, we changed from reptiles into possible mammal future. And we maintained that reptilian brain, which controls a whole lot of what we do. And as the brain evolved and we became mammals and we became smarter, the brain sort of started getting these layers over it. So you got the limbic system and then you got the neocortex, which is our current brain. 
and, and so the brain's evolution. But it stems from the reptilian brain, which is right at the deep inside of everything you do. So, you know, when, when somebody does that to you, you blink your eye, it's actually your reptilian brain that's taken over because you don't have time to react. So that's how the reptilian brain works. You don't control it, it controls you at several levels. And when you think back of the kind of food that you love, that definition for every person is different. When I think back of the kind of food that I love, I think of when I was six years old, my grandmother would make this food and I would sit on the wall when it was raining and I would eat all this amazing food and that sort of has an emotional connect in my head. So when you show me pictures like that, this is wonderful food and I'm happy to eat it as Pascal can vouch for it. He's been trying to tell the people at the kitchen to make less food for me and I've been eating like a demon. But food that I love is food like that. You know, things that my grandmother made and that's a thing that's for everybody over here. And I think when you write about food, you've got to sort of bring that gut into it. And you've got to realize that it's the passion for food that people are looking at. They're not looking at only what you're saying technically about what's in front of you. They're looking at how it makes you feel, how it makes you react, uh, the love that you can bring forward when you see that food, what it does to your head when you look at it. And therein lies my answer to what is good food and what is good food writing. I think they're deeply connected. So, um, despite the fact that I don't use mine, I think it's got a lot to do with the brain. <laughs> I agree. Pascal, what do you think? <laughs> no, I think uh, I agree with you. First of all, thank you for letting me speak for a minute. Thank you. <laughs> I agree with you because I think food is all about emotion. And I think uh, when you grow up with certain type of food, uh, it brings you back memory. So a good dish means that that's what I used to, my grandmother, my mother used to cook for me. I'm obviously from France, where we believe we have the best food in the world. And uh, in some extent, I think we do. But uh, <coughs> and that's until I came to India, which I've never seen so many passionate about the food. Talking about so much passion and a little ingredient that they make a beautiful dish with. So it's all the passion, how they talk about the food, how they cook. For me also, a good cook is wonderful people with extremely good talents, with passion and good ingredients. Obviously, you come up with a beautiful picture because I think a good meal starts with the visual, but most importantly is what that, uh, the feeling that you have when you eat the food. And if you were to talk about yesterday's session um, and take Gandhiji's example, almond paste and, uh, was it coconut water? Almond paste and coconut water is very good for you. Okay, actually I'm going to change the question a little from here because it's quite clear that good food is actually very subjective to each of us. I mean, some people might say healthy food, some other people might say, of course, comfort and nostalgia related and everything else because it was probably not a, not a question that you can really get a definite answer to. So I'm going to ask you, Chef, um, what do you think we people are looking for in a restaurant when you go? Because I'm not looking for khichri and that kind of stuff. When I go, I can have it at home. So uh, in your experiences that people come dining, obviously they're looking for things which look nice. And let's take one of your restaurants. I think we look at uh, Chennai in specific, since we all live here. Uh, the market is evolving drastically. You see loads of new restaurants coming in, uh, people traveling, so people obviously trying new things, new restaurants, uh, going overseas. They come back, they have certain expectations of what food should be, uh, different regions that they have traveled. So you see an influx of uh, new restaurants coming to Chennai very quickly. I mean, over the past year, I think I noticed there must have been at least three new Japanese restaurants that have opened. I mean, uh, Probably 10, 15 years ago, you would cringe at the thought of eating raw fish. <laughs> but now, that market is opening up. Uh, people are getting used to it. So, there's a tremendous emphasis. Uh, people want to try new things. So. Now, having said that, there's also a traditional market that wants to eat your idli tosa, your bada, all of those things. Now, how can you modernize that or how can you make it look more palatable in a new way? So, that's also being experimented here at the moment. Uh, so there's a whole ball game happening, and Chennai is changing. That's good, um, but not changing as erratically fast as the rest of the city, and that is what is really an attractive um, you know, thing for us. Um, if I have to move on to another subject, 
what is the kind of food that is really close to each and every of each and everybody, everybody, anybody in India? What kind of food are we talking about? When I say everybody loves it, at some point or the other, they've eaten it. Ghar ka khana. Ghar ka khana, of course. <laughs> what else? Street food. I think street food is the big thing where we are concerned. Uh, all over the world, I believe two billion people eat out in the streets every day. And particularly in India, uh, we've, in Bombay itself, we've got 10 lakh hawkers. And I think, is that what a lot of time you all are eating also? Uh, yeah, roadside dhabas, uh, street we're, food? We're, yeah, almost always on the street and it's wonderful. And I, you know, it's, if you have really extraordinary food with some wonderful ingredients, there are going to be a lot of people that won't just, it just won't appeal to them. Your cardamom, for example, is something that I don't personally like. I can't really eat food with cardamom in it. Really? And a lot of people love it. But that's eliminating a lot of uh, North Indian food. There you go, absolutely. So there's strong taste of very specialized food that a lot of people love. Then you come back to food that's really bad. And, and you know, some people love that too. Just, some people might not like spices at all. They might like boiled foods or whatever. That's there. And then you come to the middle. And when you come to the middle spectrum, that's food that's not bad. It's not, it doesn't make a spike on any graph, but that's food that understands you and that you understand. So if you take the foods that have spread across this country everywhere, apart from chow mein, which is of course the number one Indian food in the world, <laughs> it's everywhere. Uh, if you look at the ones that are really popular, you've got, you've got the dosas, you've got the, the, the sort of South Indian, the dosa idlis that have taken over everywhere. And you have the Punjabi foods, the, you know, the butter chickens and the dals and, and they've taken over pretty much across the country. You can get those anywhere you go in this nation. Anywhere. You are still talking about um, highway eating or roadside eating. I'm, I'm talking about absolutely on the street. Like we eat bhel puri and pani puri and um, dahi barara puri, pao bhaji, vada pao in Bombay. Like, you know, half of us are eating on the street. What's your opinion of that? Because in the north, for example, in Banaras or Agra, some of the best kind of foods are on the street. Well, uh, street food is, is compelling anywhere because it's... A, it's evolved. It's a lot older than what we think it is. Now, Bombay is, of course, more recent, Pau Bhaji, and the some stuff that you mentioned. Some of it is more recent, but then Mumbai is a more recent city than, than most other parts of the country. If you get out into the older parts of the country, you have traditional street foods that, have, that people have cut their teeth on when they've been sort of growing up. And the foods over there are extremely diverse. So we're talking about magnificent recipes that are dying out in a way yes. to speak of. Because it's only the same guy doing Absolutely. it for years and years and three generations. And, and the best representation of them is usually on the street because you have a guy who's been cooking the same thing for 40 years, maybe three generations, maybe an intricate recipe, just one thing that he does beautifully and every morning when he opens his shop ready to serve, there's a line of 50 people well, outside. That's the only thing on the menu they'll have. Like, and that's yeah, it. That's the only thing. And, and that's sort of true street food for me. You know, it's a, a lot of authors here. Yesterday I asked a question, I said, do you write for your audience or do you write for yourself and your audience sort of catches on and, and most people are of the opinion that they sort of pretty much do what they want to do. I think that's pretty sincere with food as well. Right. You, the, the people who make food that people love are the ones who do it to the best of their ability with a lot of love and a lot of sincerity. And great price, value. And, value a great money. price, always. Yeah. I think a great example of that is uh, in Mandua, in Gujarat, we uh, ate at this thela, Gaba Dabeli now. Dabeli is basically they, they take pow or bun and there's a stew with um, different ingredients on it. This guy was using a lot of cinnamon and red chili and he brings his little thela and he comes twice a day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon and he makes 300 dabelis and he comes and there's a line of about 200 people already waiting there and in 20 minutes it's gone. And um, so for the camera we just asked him out of curiosity, we said, uh, Yo, you make 300, how long have you been doing it? He said, last 40 years. And we said, look, why don't you make 500, 600? Because you make 300 every morning and 300 every evening and it's all gone in like 20 minutes. You know, you have a... Ch and he said, no. He said, because to maintain the consistency and to give this wonderful food that I love making for people, 600 is the maximum I can make in a day. If I make even one more than that, I am not doing the right thing by my customers, so Amazing. I'm happy. This is, this is the role world values and... So that's and good food. That guy has a much greater chance than anybody else that's right. of making wonderful food. That's right. You heard about this um, pilot, pilot last week or two weeks ago who delayed the Jet Airways flight taking off from Jodhpur because she was waiting for the kachori, piyaz ka kachori to come. That's the kind of power that street food really has. Perfectly good reason. She by lost the way. her job, but she was waiting. I agree with you entirely, but she was waiting for this kachori to come from that guy and lost. Have you had much experience with this, what we're talking about? 
Yeah, obviously, uh, street food is a great thing, uh, especially, I mean, my journey started in Mumbai uh, five years ago, and first time I had some chats and didn't know about it. And in fact, it's so beautiful that now you want to put this in your buffet, even if you're in a five-star environment, you have street food on your buffet. You do very elaborate weddings, majestic weddings in beautiful atmosphere. You see street food in there. So I think it matched very well with the uh, In fact, that's my question to you next, uh, Pascal, that uh, street food is not just the prerogative of people in the middle class uh, economic strata. Uh, everybody eats it. I've taken uh, Hari Prasad Chaurasi. I asked him, where do you want to go to eat? And he said, let's go to Johor Chopati. And we ate on, on the beach. I asked Zakir Hussain once, where do you want to go? And we went to Muhammad Ali, Noor Muhammadis, and he had pie and things like that. So a lot of people do eat on the streets, and the only thing that people put up their nose, perhaps, is the hygiene factor. But I always maintain that ignore that, because you're just building your immunity system, you're getting stronger, it doesn't matter, and do you know anyway, it? that's where, uh, listen, that's so, so, where they probably come to the hotels, because so that is what got the hygiene factor. No, 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 so you guys, these guys are now getting street food into their um, hotels, and they call it the street food festival. Right? No, exactly. Correct. And to go further than this, I think we're also looking at uh, this kind of people who make the f uh, food on the street and employ them in our hotels. People think, oh, you must be coming from so-and-so hotel. And I mean, this, like you say, is the best guy who do this dish. And it, we know, we're looking at employing people like this as well in our hotel. Yeah. But Dharman, are you geared up? Are you, your hotel is too young right now, but I'm sure you'll do this. Are you all geared? You want to have a look at something? Can I have that last little bit? Yeah, and just while you're switching there, I just want to say street food is going to make you, uh, it's, it's good, it's not unhygienic. And if you don't believe me, I'd like to give you Exhibit it's in the A. Mind. It's exhibit in the mind. A. He lived on it. I lived on I it. I eat it 200 days a year. So. And if you still have a doubt in your head that it's good for you, it's Exhibit B. Absolutely. No, I agree. Like I said, a quarter of the people live in the streets, half of them eat off the streets. That's what I always said. And look at that. That's Hari Prasad Chaurasya. But what I want you to know, uh, to tell me, Pascal and Dharman, is, are you going to replicate this? That is beautiful. This is in Lucknow. Can you replicate this seriously? Yeah, we could do that quite easily. You quite must bear easily. witness and you must go and check it out and let me know eventually. This kind of stuff? Yes. I think this could win a beauty contest if you put a bikini on it. I mean, I would vote for it. <laughs> okay, put, put that off. We don't have to see the rest. Okay. But um, honestly, this is the heart of India. Well, listen, we give you all of that. Minus the sweat that goes into the food. That's but it. that's what makes that's it tasty. What makes it that's what makes it tasty. <laughs> Do you agree? Do you agree it makes it tasty? <laughs> you said absolutely the wrong thing. You know, it's, it's all in the mind. You just ignore that, that little rag he's wiping with, or don't look at his fingernails, and hey, all right. I mean, I, I recall a street ice cream where, you know, this lady is scooping the ice cream, and her counterpart drips a sauce onto her. Now, obviously, they don't have a, a tissue or anything, you know? And she's doing this, hoping that drip will just fall off her hand, you know? <laughs> so... She should have just licked it off. <laughs> well, you see a cockroach walking only way on to the do table is just sort of push it aside. It's okay. Uh, what do you want next? <laughs> What's your take on the sweat part? Cool, right? No, no, absolutely. It is completely Important cool. Important ingredient. I mean, there are, there are two or three things you have to realize. You have to be really savage if you're putting cold steel into hot food, first of all. I mean, that is just, uh, it's a travesty for Indian food. You can't take a dosa and cut it with a knife. Yeah. You know, it, it's horrible. So you have to eat with your hands. And you have to make really good food with your hands as well. And when you do that, you know, if you want to make an omelet, you're going to have to crack some eggs. And when you're standing in the Chennai heat over a big pan, which you're cooking for 300 people, sweat makes up a very important part and of it. And it's not just hands, it's also your feet. I've seen people <laughs> kneading dough with their feet. There you go. You know, so. But it's not so much the hand, it's also the wipe when they clean up their workplace after. Have you seen it? But so, yeah. I mean, this. <laughs> now, uh, this ladies is, and gentlemen, this there's is wonderful tea and snacks after this. We Frenchman must all go talking. and eat. Elegant Frenchman <laughs> talking. Have you seen that? Uh, no, we have not seen it. No, there's one guy in Chennai, I see he's doing this lemon juice, you know, and he's obviously every time he cut the lemon and he just wipe it, uh, his work surface on it, and please have a look. Exciting, exciting. <laughs> <laughs>
He's not cutting ice. What do you say, Mayur? We, we live in a very challenging environment. I, I think you have to sort of get used to that if you're going to last in India. And we don't really fall ill. We all have cast iron stomachs because of that. But like you say, after a while you get immune, you get sick one or twice, and then off you go, you're fine. There you go. You know, I mean, you make <laughs> living I, I, out of it. I had an uncle once who said, if it's not going to kill you, it's going to make you fat. So just eat anything you find. <laughs> and that is always good advice. Absolutely. Always. Do you want to say something about anything? Uh, to Mayur. Uh, Address it to Mayur. Oh, to me. Okay, you were looking there. So. I, I want to say, um, how, much, how much time do we have? That's uh, quick. No, Nobody came up with one questions. of those signs. You want to talk to some people out there? I can barely see most of you, but I would like to speak. We have 30 minutes. Oh, that's a long time. Woohoo! <laughs> <Yay! laughs> <Yay! laughs> now we're talking. All right, go ahead. So, Farzana, tell us about, about what you do now. I, I have been all across the country and I have seen two people very proudly bring your magazine out. And that's not the kind of usual people that you feature on your magazine. One was in Sanman Cafe in Alibagh, where you did a little story on a family that runs a family eatery. And uh, you'd given them three pages, the very nice photograph, and they were so proud of it. Why don't you feature more street food and regional foods on your, in your magazine? First of all, I didn't miss that uh, lopsided, left-handed, backsided compliment. In all his journeys, two or three people told him, bullshit. But, but, but no, no, no. <laughs> you know, if you, you know, got the compliment, you didn't the, say The that. question he, is… He's not that mean. I'm just pulling his leg. But the fact remains that we honestly started this up across 14 years ago. We started Afternoon, which is my afternoon newspaper in Bombay, 28 years ago. Busy Bee started writing 60, 50 years ago. So we are the guys who changed the cult of eating. And it might be called upper crust, but that's just the upper crust of the food. It's not the upper crust, upper crust. So we've actually been patronizing a lot of street food. What I didn't show the rest because I thought it might be boring is the amazing food we've done in um, Banaras, in Agra, in Delhi, you name it. I mean. Everywhere possible. So I'm, I'm a big flag bearer for street food and I've been doing it and Alibagh was just one of the places. Uh, these guys have been to how many? 250 episodes. In the last 14 years we do, it's a quarter so that's not that many. But we have pretty much covered east, west, north, south uh, and a lot. And street food is always, it's not only really street food because if you have to ask me what is my definition of uh, good food, it does not go so much into fancy restaurants as much as mid-level restaurants. In Bombay, like for example, we have Swati and we have Trishna and we have you know, middle-level restaurants. And that's where you get, because at the end of the day, um, it's all about also how much money you pay for the food. You go to Wasabi in the Taj and you are out of pocket by about 8,000 bucks per head. At the end of the day, you don't feel good about that, you know? I mean, you know, we've, we are journalists and we get a lot of freebies. But um, even you when do? I'm, even of course, be <laughs> how honest. do you swing that? I mean, I tell us how to forget all could this stuff about food. Oh, could we have a little chat? Yeah. After this and I, out I with don't it. eat. I mean, when I was invited somewhere and I looked at the right hand side and I said, I can't eat here. Ah, okay. It so is free. I couldn't eat it. That's the problem. We eat, so we don't get free food. She doesn't eat, so she gets offered free no, food. What he's saying? I couldn't hear. <laughs> I couldn't hear. <laughs> Repeat. So, something wrong here. Now uh, remember, you have to walk in next time. We go somewhere and say, me, I'm not eating. <laughs> At least I'll get a free meal out of that. That'll go down well. That'll go down well. But I mean, that's a singular reason why we've been doing this show for so long. I mean, for those of you who have any doubts or you really want to know what inspired the why show. Why don't you get up and do one little gig? Okay, can I quickly uh, finish that thought? Pascal so and get yes. up and do a Pascal gig. and Dharmain, we're not eating at your, rest, uh, at your, at your thing, so don't How handle us a <laughs> I didn't say trippies. How many of you have seen this shows? Raise your hands. Wow. So you don't want… That's not Thank bad. you. I have tears in my eyes. You are 64. <laughs> Of the 93 people that watch our show, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> He's not modest for sure. So, you see, that's the typical profile of people who watch our show. They are interested in literature, arts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All the good finer one. things in life. You know, he's joking, but I did my due diligence. I, I did my due diligence and it, it did kick up that theirs was one of the most popular shows. Um, I'm pleasantly and happily surprised and glad for you, seriously. But I was in Bangalore recently, I was in Coorg recently, and, and everybody seems to watch you guys. I, I've got to start watching too. Thank you, don't stop, please, guys. Let Farzana speak, guys, let's just sit back. No. Yeah. Can right. you ask the question, how many of them have been to Lila Palace, Chennai? How many? <laughs> it's all muffled, I can't hear, what is this? How many of them have been to Lila Palace, Chennai? I'd like to know as well. <laughs> 
th this is becoming a market survey. How many of you have been to Leela? Chen you got to work on your marketing skills. You okay, remember well, when you go to the we'll Leela Chennai, if you say we're those. not eating, you might get a free meal, right? Yes, actually, <laughs> straight from your dinner at, at, you know, that's what Chef really specializes. And Chef Karmen promises no, 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 not to no, sweat no, over your food. No, jokes aside, that restaurant is really going to do it. I don't even know the name. It's the coffee shop at the Leela. It's called but Spectra. They, Spectra is Spectra. the main restaurant. It's, it's got seven counters, seven cuisines, and I had the most amazing, hold your breath, baked Alaskan crab this afternoon. It was to die for. I've been enough places and seen enough and tasted enough, but this was excellent. And are you going to offer Thank each you. of them a portion when they come with some voucher? Hey, which will come we'll in the have Hindu to look at tomorrow. That. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Your baked Alaska always reminds me of Sarah Palin for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> It's uh, it I can't get the image out of my head. It must have been those cookies she eats all the time. See, the good thing about food is you don't have to defend it, you know. <laughs> the people will speak for it, so. No, it is. It's wonderful. In fact, I ate at Spectra the other day and I ate, uh, ate some sushi and we had Japanese. Right. And it was uh, spectacular. So, hats off. I mean, that's, it's wonderful food. And Actually, that, that brings me to the question. Um, yes, we know tastes are evolving and we know that people are getting into more as they travel more. But how will you influence change in people to try things which are otherwise not there and not have, haven't been on the menu? How are you going to do when that? They, when they do come, uh, like all things, you need a very strong marketing campaign uh, propagating your restaurants. And then when they do come, you give them a tasting of it. You think marketing campaigns really get people to come and uh, taste? The, the sort where you call 400 people and give them free food, yeah, that's a great marketing campaign, right? <laughs> well, that we, that, 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 that we've already Look, announced. I think that, that, the best that one we've already is word said it's mouth. coming in the Hindu. Big, big opportunity yes. for a marketing Pascal? campaign right here. Just invite all these people over, give them some food. So on behalf of you, Pascal, we've just given away everybody a baked Alaskan crab. <laughs> Thank you. The voucher is going to appear in the Hindu day after tomorrow and they will all come. Please honor it. Listen, Thank I you. could all give you a baked Alaskan crab, but I'll soon be out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, food, uh, food though, however, I have to say this, we Indians are very connected and committed to the foods that we eat. And that is not necessarily something positive. I, for example, couldn't eat food pretty much 200 kilometers away from where I lived. It is only now, after so many years of traveling and trying out different foods of India, that I've begun to develop an appreciation for some foods. And some of them can be quite radical, but I must say this to everyone. If you ever go abroad, and this is one of the unique things, if you go to an Italian restaurant in India, you'll find a lot of Indians there. But if you go to an Indian restaurant in anywhere else in the world, you will also find a lot of Indians in there. Because we don't like to experiment with our food mostly. And, and it grows, and, and I know it can be hard sometimes. For example, we went to Nagaland and somebody said, let me cook something special for you. And they brought out this little leaf and they opened it up, which was an ingredient that they were going to cook pork with. And he ran out of the room. And, and it was he, vegetarian. He, he ran out. It was soybean fermented, <laughs> stank to high heaven. It's called akhuni and it is one of the most wild smelling things that you will ever eat yeah. in your life. It, and yes, and that's the whole thing. And once they had cooked the pork with it, the akhuni pork, I couldn't stop eating it. And that's, you know, that's, that's what we I find. I suspect the that had nothing to do with the akhuni. That's, no, but your taste that's just you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame it on the akhuni. <laughs> Your taste buds are getting very adventurous now because so, you've seen so much. Tell me, what is the worst or the best, whatever, that you've eaten, the trickiest that you've eaten, like you just mentioned? What is, have you tried well, it's, uh, I, I overseas? I, I would just say I am uh, not qualified to comment on a lot of foods that are not the foods that I'm familiar with. No, no, so, so what have you eaten? Have you been adventurous? Have you been... Oh my God, I've eaten everything. I was grasshoppers, snakes... No, uh, monkey brain? Insects. Monkey brains. No, I can't Thank say God. I have. Uh, I, I there's tea snacks after this. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm familiar with brain drain, but not that kind of thing. <clears throat> no, well, monkey brains I haven't... I don't even think anybody eats monkey brains in India. I think we do eat a lot India. of goat brains. Not India. Not India. It's oh, elsewhere. China. Yeah, that's what I said, elsewhere, overseas. Oh. I mean... Uh, should I go ahead? I'm sure the people who know please, this. Please, please. There's this monkey which they keep under the table. And there's a hole in the middle of the table. And the monkey is seated there and just the head, the skull is out. And the guy comes and it's a great performance and ceremony and, and they just slice that head off. Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom, I saw that. Woo! Gosh. Yeah. And they spoons and they scoop out the, the brain. And it's considered an aphrodisiac. And 
And that's it. No, I, I have my limits. I have problems with my own brain. I just monkey brains. Is, 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 you eat your own brains? <laughs> well, he eats my <laughs> head enough. He eats my head up so enough. So I <laughs> thought uh, eating snails and frog legs was bad enough. But frog this legs is, is yeah. very tame now. Very frog nice. legs is tame. What yeah, else? I have Estago to say this though, is very tame. Yeah. The, the French, for example, really respect their ingredients and they'll bring them in from all over with great consideration. And we do that too, and it's, you'd be surprised at how intricately people on the street do that. The Tunde Kababi, for example, in Lucknow, which is in the heart of the country, and I'm sure you know where Lucknow is, has 153 ingredients in each kebab. 150? 153 leaves, roots, spices, herbs, uh, shoots. Uh, I don't even know 153 names of the things you can put goat. in food. What's that? The goat. The goat? Yeah. That's one. You forgot that. Oh. For sure. Uh, and, and so there is a sort of back culture of ingredients, but we don't really get enough. And do you have that problem with, with hotels right now? Is ingredients think, yeah, a problem? Are you importing most of, items of them? like just a simple galoti kebab. Mm. It's supposed to be 25, 30. Well, that's the one spices. we're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. So it varies from chef to chef. It's an old recipe. Uh, and to get the balance of almost even 30 ingredients into one particular kebab, it's not easy. It is a task. It's sure. a task in itself. To now to replicate balance. it day in, day out, because the clientele that comes asks for the same thing, and that's the challenge. It is, in fact. The and you consistency. Know, that's where the specialization comes in. Uh, do you know that if you eat a gilotti kebab, which is the tunde kebab, is one of the examples of that, there is a man who mixes the spices. So he'll put in different things in different sort of measures, and he's known as a masalchi. Correct. So the masalchi's job is to just make the masala, and then he's going to send it out, and then you have the kebabchi, whose job it is to actually prepare the masala with the meat. And then you have the guy who fries it. And so it's, it's a very specialized sort of thing. And, uh, and that's incredible. But again, I'll, I'll ask you the, the question. Do you find that you're struggling for ingredients in India? I mean, does that happen a it's lot? It's a challenge to source the, the best of ingredients. And most people don't know that. So you're going to have a perennial supply of, of mango. But out there, if you're looking at business opportunities in food, and I think it's critical that we're always looking at food and how we can get more of it. Uh, supply of ingredients in foods is, is one of the biggest things, I think which is going to come in the future. And you're going to find people talking more about the finer points of food, such as ingredients, okay. things that you don't eat. The tepper, for example, is a, is a wonderful little spice that makes your tongue tingle and makes you want to throw up if you chew it for more than one minute. Okay. But in food, it, uh, any of you familiar with the tepper? Do you know what it's called in Tamil Nadu? Or the machinga from Nagaland, little pepper. Do you have it in Tamil, uh, in Tamil Nadu, the tepper? Shout it out loud, come on. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Good question. Sorry. It's <laughs> so it's the best way I can describe, I don't even know what it is, but it, it's a little four-leaf, it's a little four-leaf clover that opens up like that. It has a little seed in it, it has a little base, and it looks like a cardamom almost, yeah. which is opened up on top, and it makes your tongue tingle. It's really fun. And if you give it to your... If you give it to your cameraman and he chews it for more than one minute, he's violently sick. It's even more fun. It's and a great starter at a, at a dinner, sit-down dinner party for eight people. You all eat it and then nobody can say anything. So, good entertainment. So, th we've, we've eaten it in Karnataka a couple of times. And then in Nagaland, it's called Machinga. And they have it in Assam and Nagaland and all these areas. And it's, it's wonderful. And there's a lot of things you can do. Marathi Mogu. There we go. That's what it is. See? Well, since you're here, they're just making that up. Yeah, the someone in. answering that. What is that, ma'am? So it's used in busy Malabhat and it's a Marathi something. And it's not grown anywhere now. No. The Marathis are everywhere now. Yeah, I know. It's to do, it's to do with the party. Is it something pointy? Is it a pointed spice? Um, well, it's it, a flower-like thing. It no? sort of looks like this. And a little stick at the bottom. Isn't he describing a lotus, <laughs> lotus root? <laughs> so that, we have a lot of technical know-how about food, so that was an example yeah. of that. <laughs> Great. What else? Go on. Uh, yeah, I, I think we can throw it open to questions. Anybody has any questions? 
You've answered all of them without them asking. Oh, there, I, I can see one hand going very straight up. We have to give it to that lady over there. I've never seen a hand extended that no, far. No, there are more than one. No, there's somebody here. I have a question on the quality of produce. I think after, after France, after Paris, I've lived there for a while, the best produce is in Chennai. What do you think? Oh, really? <laughs> I'm very happy. Think. We have to discover, like I said, have to keep coming here again. The best produce. What produce are you talking about? Generally? Yes. And home food tastes wonderful here, but I felt it tasted even better in Paris uh, from the marches. So what does Pascal think about it? I'm from Nice, from the south. Pascal's from Kerala. He can't so. answer questions about a rival state. <laughs> He's from no, the that's south, not fair. south of France. Not south here. <laughs> not south of India. <laughs> not south of India. He was hoping that you'd south get misled. Of France, south of France. No, I mean, I'm sure uh, we have uh, equally good product, but it's a different type of food as well, different ingredients. But uh, you're probably referring to one speci specific dish where you find this particular ingredient is the best in Chennai. So I can only concur with this. So. The sambar in oh, Paris tastes better. Really? Please, please, please wow. let the man speak. I, I love his questions. They're, they're awesome. What's his so, question? Somebody give him a, I, I don't know what he's going to ask, but I love it already. <laughs> <laughs> but biryani was never discussed. We stand corrected. Uh, uh, it's a national actually, dish. Actually, uh, we did discuss biryani right at the beginning when I talked about our driver Muthu and how he eats vegetable biryani when he's fasting. So, oh, technical no. point. Technically. Technical point. I mean, we firmly believe anything that starts with biryani is going to end well. Nobody is so right. We, you know, we always you, have a biryani story you in the talked, beginning. He's very right. You talked about veg biryani, which is no biryani. <laughs> Food is on stage. Many, many, many spoke about, on, when you talk about food, you only spoke about grandmother's food. Nobody talks about spouse's food. Why? Because <laughs> I'm sick of cooking. I can't take it anymore. My wife makes me do it three oh. times a day. Oh. And I refuse to talk about it when the I'm out. <laughs> um, yeah, so my question was to Mayur. Sorry, can I just stand turn up, the tables on up. you? Why, why don't, don't you, you tell up? us what, what, why don't you tell us what you think of your spouse's cooking? And is she here with you? It's See? good, huh? Can yeah. you stand up whoever's asking the question, I, I can please? see the lady at the back. Hi. Yeah. Yeah, so my question was to Mayur. You've gone around, um, you know, with, through your show tasting different cuisines. Being a vegetarian, do, do you feel that you've been limited by it? Not really. I mean, it, in some places it might take a little bit more searching than others in the Northeast. Um, and even along the coast and stuff, but no. There have been a couple of places where I've sat there and complained a lot, and that's basically just to um, try and ruin his meal. Um, you might not in certain places get the complexity of food or the range of food, but you do get something vegetarian, and that's actually a concern, and that's a big part of why we, what we believe in and why we do the show and what we, why we wrote the book and put it out there, that there are lots of wonderful plants, fruits, vegetables, Teppal, machinga, that we've had access to traditionally, but a lot of those are dying out. Most people don't even know about a lot of these things. We went to a place in Mangalore where these four brothers, they run uh, the Ayodhya Hotel. Ayodhya. They… And the manager is called Ramchandar. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's true, it's true. And they do uh, a whole range of snacks, the most expensive of which is 12 rupees. And some of these are made with, uh, there was one which is made with some sort of leaf that only grows for like three weeks after the monsoon. And then you have to process it and dry it and, and then they make these snacks and we ask them, you know, why do you go through all this effort and is it really worth the 12 rupees that people are going to uh, pay you for it? And they said that these are all foods that we grew up, our grandmothers used to cook them, and, you know, back in the day when they were more than 24 hours in a day. And he said, now people live on their own, young people who go, go into office, nuclear families, they will forget they don't have access to all these foods. They will forget that all these, these are part of our culture, part of our heritage. So there are pockets of people just trying to do this, but there's not enough people doing it. Does that answer your question? I, I so sort of words, went off track a little bit. In but other words, yeah, you're it's absolutely not, it's not all right bad. being a vegetarian. I mean, look at me, do I look like I suffer from lack of food, really? No, I meant like limit your food experience, not accessibility to food. What? Sorry. Limit your food experience, not 
access to vegetarian food. A food, yeah, I agree with you. Food's a great experience. Food is always a good but experience. But in our country, uh, there's so much of vegetarian food, really, honestly, that nobody can ever feel the loss or you cannot miss non-vegetarian and, and in India, I think a majority of Indians uh, are, are not vegetarian. vegetarian. And it's a myth that a majority of Indians are vegetarian, but they're not. I would say about 70% of India is not vegetarian. And I, I would also say non-vegetarian is not really a word at all. It doesn't exist in the dictionary. It, it doesn't mean anything. So either you're a vegetarian or you're not. And, and because there will always be, I mean, it's very simple. If you take all the ingredients that you have that are vegetarian in nature and then throw in a couple of animals in there, your choices go up. <laughs> so <laughs> there will or never not. be a place where you'll have more choice of vegetarian as opposed to uh, not vegetarian. I have uh, two quick questions for both of you. Yeah, uh, Rocky and Mayur, it's a sheer delight to be with both of you Thank in you. person in the flesh. Have you ever done Calcutta? Have you do ever done the foods of Bengal in Highway on My Plate? And this, my second question, which has nothing to do directly with this particular gathering, is you did a show on the supernatural for NDTV. Why has it been canned? You answer the first one, I'll answer the second one. But, but you'll tell lies if you answer no, the no, second no, I'll one. Tell, I'll tell the truth. I'll tell the truth. <laughs> We've, we've done several episodes uh, in Bengal yeah. and we have, uh, we've covered the cuisine of Bengal several times and I think it's a magnificent cuisine and it's a, sort of the great wall of cuisine that divides the seven sisters from the rest of the country. But we've not been able to evolve their cuisine into our diets because of Bengali food right there. Mm -hmm. So yes, we have been to all the places, we've had the mochar ganto and the uh, and the Dab Chingri and the, the Hilsa and everything. The Hilsa, you name it. I mean, it's, uh, it's wonderful. And it's a spectacular cuisine. So there's about 15 episodes uh, that we've done in Bengal. And we, uh, you know, if you sit, a friend of mine was telling me the other day, they said, he said, you don't have enough food information in your shows. I said, if you take a pen and a paper and sit down and start writing all the food information that you get, you'd be surprised with what you end up with at the end. It's just because it's delivered in a, in a rather relaxed manner so that you can also is enjoy. Is the word relaxed? Is it insane? Is the word relaxed manner? <laughs> well, well, we can stretch we can that word. We can do another adjective. <laughs> but, but I do think that, that food is something that comes from the heart and I do think that we have to be less serious about our food because, you know, playing with your food is a wonderful thing and we're all taught don't play with your food. So I, I suggest go home and just play with your food and you will love it. And when you start playing with preparing it, that's when you'll really have a good time. So, uh, yes, several times, and the supernatural thing. Um, short answer, because I'd rather be the one that's doing the eating than be in a position where something might eat me. Uh, you should, uh, we shot India's Most Haunted. This was a show for those of you who might not have seen it. It was just going out there. The idea, the basic idea was the same, to explore the stories of, of our wonderful country. Food on one hand and, and the supernatural. And you're going to abandon buildings and you're going to places that are like, very dilapidated, there's, there's snakes, there's scorpions, there's none of which I can eat. Um, yeah, and uh, it was very, and I have a very active imagination. I saw, I saw a ghost where there were none. We, we had some strange things happen to us, which we've actually not put on the screen because it, it's such radical stuff that if you put it on, then people are like, ah, you're faking it. So it, it was a call, we were asked to do another one and, and, and I just said no and uh, Lara Datta wasn't available, so Rocky couldn't do it all by himself. So it's a, um, um, yes, please. One last question. I have no idea. It's, it's actually quite pleasant. And I think it's the emotional connect that we have with the dog as an animal. Well, if you have the emotional connect, I don't think you eat a I think, lot. I think we're going to take your question, last question. Yeah. Um, yes. Have you seen that some, some states are very popular? For example, the food from certain, certain states are very popular. But for example, a big state like Maharashtra, we don't see much of those restaurants. Is it because more people from the south have migrated, more people Bengalis have migrated abroad. You see specific restaurants of those themes, but a big state like Maharashtra doesn't have its own, um, you don't see Maharashtra restaurants. And any, have you ever thought about that? If, if you ask uh, Raj Thakre the question, he'll probably say, because all the cooks are North Indian and that's, that's their fault. But, um, no, but he is right. To give oh, you a little more or me? Uh, not you. Okay, just checking. Oh, no, not me. Raj to Thakre give you a right. serious answer, you are very justified in that. Uh, we don't have too many restaurants in Bombay or, or Maharashtra catering to Maharashtrian food, which is fantastic. And in fact, we have actually made a presentation.
thinking about starting uh, restaurants, cuisine from Kolhapur and all, which is fantastic. But that's true of everywhere in India. You go to Lucknow, you're not going to find a good restaurant. You go to Hyderabad, you're not. The best foods that you really get are in people's homes. And that's going to just... Be I, uh, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with that since you've, you've talked about Kolhapur. If you just come and see me after this, I'll tell you four places where you can go and eat food that will change your mind in some place or the other. In Kolhapur. There's a Vada Pau guy, there's a uh, Kolhapur. Kolhapur. No, Kolhapur. not Kolhapur. Yeah. Kolhapur, there. Last I checked, Colombo had <laughs> sort of separated from the state of Maharashtra because. No, but when you take the great seats, you know, he's sitting too close to me, so the sounds are getting too muffled. No, no, there's, there's, there, there is, there's wonderful food out there, yes. Um, unfortunately, the, the, there are only two or three different types of cuisines that become really popular and famous. Um, you know, the, the typical North Indian food, the, the Idli dosas. But there's, there's wonderful food out there, and for, food out there, and that's. That's one of the underpinning reasons why we do the show. So more of the people in our country can discover good food. Now, since we're talking about Kolhapur, I'll take, give you a quick example. We had uh, a mechanic who was fixing a scooter and we went to this place called uh, Mahakali Se, was, who was it? And he came running across and he told Rocky, Main aapka show de, mujhe. he was speaking in Marathi. So we said, uh, do, you, do you understand Hindi? He said, toda, toda. And we said, do you understand English? He said, no. So he said, look, our show's in English. Why do you watch it? So he says, I turn the volume off and I just laugh. <laughs> because I don't need to understand. Through you, I get to see parts of my country that I would never see. And, I, and, and he said this in broken Marathi. He said, I can see what my brothers in the Northeast are eating and stuff. And he said, I can also learn that there is so much more out there in terms of different things that people eat. Yeah. So, I, uh, There was a lady walking around with a sign that said, it's a something. I couldn't read it. So yeah, it's a wrap. Right and Ooh. that's… they're not talking about a wrap. Can, can it's those nice wrap street. They want us to get up and leave now. That's can I have request. cucumber and avocado with that wrap? <laughs> I knew they're going to pun on that. All right. One request. Uh, Rocky, Mayur. Wait, wait. She, she went first. Please. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, yes. uh, before you leave us uh, today, could you please uh, give us a food court? Uh, we, we were about to do that anyways. But we were? <laughs> yes. You never told me. And I'm all about surprises. Okay, he's got it. He's okay. got it. Uh, I got the first two lines. You'll have to make up the first two. Uh, we'll make them up as we go along. Come um, on. We keep it very simple. We came to Chennai for the Hindu lit fest, but eating at Murugan is what we like best. <laughs> Thank you very Our much. Our experiences Thank you. with Tamil food have been absolutely grand. We're going to leave the stage now. Please give us all up again. Come on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.